In today's video, we're going over the clinical examination of spondylolysis and spondylolisthesis. Let's do it. A spondylolysis is a fracture or deflect to the pars interarticularis, which is a portion of the vertebrae right here. So this is my spine. These are the spinous processes that stick backwards. Right over here is my pars interarticularis. And there's actually a fracture in this model right here. There's a fracture on both sides. Now, if a fracture is on both sides, it can progress to a spondylolisthesis, which is going to be slippage of one vertebrae on the other. This injury is common in adolescent athletes, particularly in sports require extension of the spine, like gymnasts or let's say a football lineman. Spiny fractures are a common asymptomatic finding. So if you take a general population and you MRI all their spines, you're gonna find that about 90% of folks with spiny fractures don't have any pain whatsoever. However, they can become symptomatic and they're treated a little bit differently than let's say non-specific low back pain. So it's important that we diagnose these accurately. So McKaylee in 1995 was looking at adolescent athletes between the ages of 12 and 18 with low back pain performed imaging on these athletes' spines and found that 47% of these athletes actually had a spiny fracture. Now that stat is very alarming. What's even more alarming is he probably haven't hit the like button or subscribed to the channel yet. So what's important about diagnosing these accurately is because they're treated a little bit differently than other forms of low back pain. Let's say non-specific low back pain. For these folks, you can be a little bit more aggressive with your rehab. You don't have to pull them back from sports quite as much. So how Hua Wu in 2022 found that if you compare patients that have spiny fractures and just modify their activities versus modifying their activities and adding a brace and adding physical therapy, you actually have a superior outcome, right? So if you have a patient with a suspected spiny fracture, they probably have to go to the doctor first, but afterwards we probably have to be a little more aggressive in terms of pulling back from sports, starting physical therapy right away, potentially adding a brace. From what I've read, the research on using a brace is mixed. We don't really know if you need a brace, right? I'm also not the expert, but I've found that regionally, it's going to depend which doctor you send your patients to. Uh, I'm in the Boston area and the doctors around here like to brace their athletes. Other parts of the United States, I don't see it quite as much. And just like I was saying previously, if we don't catch these injuries early on, don't treat these appropriately, they may turn into something worse like a spondylolisthesis. We just don't want that to happen. These injuries can be either acute or all at once, or they can be gradual in nature. Let's say you have a patient that's coming in, they were swinging a baseball bat and they felt a sharp pain in their spine. They may have gotten a spiny injury all at once. Uh, the other piece that could be gradual in nature. Let's say you have a similar athlete and they notice their back starts to hurt after practice. And then after a while, it tends to get a little worse. And now they feel when they throw and they feel a little bit when they hit. And eventually it might get to the point where they have to stop all activities because it hurts so bad. These injuries also tend to feel better with rest and they feel worse with activities. So essentially playing your sport tends to bother these folks. Pain tends to be exacerbated with activities that require either extension of the spine or extension combined with rotation. So essentially, if I'm a gymnast, back bending tends to hurt. If I'm a baseball player, rotating extended spine, like I'm hitting or throwing, tends to bother it. Irano et al. in 2012 found that extension of the spine had an 89% sensitivity for ruling out spiny fractures. So if you have an athlete comes in and extends and doesn't hurt. Decently certain they don't have a spiny injury. However, the specificity of this test is not great. So you can't be certain someone has a spiny fracture if they have pain with extension. And lastly, generally speaking, spinal flexion doesn't hurt too bad. So if you have a patient go down and touch their toes and it feels great, but spinal extension feels terrible, you might start thinking this may be a spiny injury. The other piece is that flexion can hurt. It's just usually extension is worse than flexion. Next, we're gonna go through a clinical examination. I think the important thing to keep in mind is that the sensitivities as well as the specificities of all these tests are not great, right? Uh, generally speaking, the sensitivities of these tests are a little bit better than the specificities. But what I will say is you can't hang your hat on any one of these tests because you're probably gonna be getting false negatives and false positives. The first thing I like to look at is spinal flexion. Okay, so generally speaking, spinal flexion isn't as painful as extension. In the order of importance for testing, obviously extension is more important, but I don't wanna do a bunch of extension at the beginning of my examination so they get really irritated. I like to start with the flexion, but I'm expecting the flexion to feel a little bit better than extension. First, what we can do is an easy toe touch. So let's have you stand with your feet together, Tara. And from here, lock out those knees and go ahead and touch your toes. Very good. And is this giving you trouble? Feels pretty good. 
So essentially you're just gonna get an idea of how bad it feels to touch the toes. Again, it could hurt a little bit, but if we're suspecting a spiny fracture, it's probably gonna hurt worse to extend. So next we're gonna look at child's pose. So essentially you have Tara here, knees together, sitting butt to heels and trying to round her spine as much as possible. And again, what we're looking to see is how much does it hurt to flex the spine? So how much you hurt in this position here, Tara? She feels pretty good, excellent. Next, we're gonna look at spinal extension. And the first test we're going to do is hands on hips, extension, just like so, okay? So go ahead and put your hands on your hips, Sarah, and then back bend as far as you feel like you can. Is this reproducing any of your familiar symptoms? Okay, very good. One-legged hyperextension test. We're gonna have Tara stand on her right leg and just support yourself with your left leg right next to your foot here. Hands stay on hips, and from here, I want you to back bend as far as you're able to. Good. A positive special test would be a reproduction of the patient's familiar symptoms. Did that bother you? Okay, good. So keep in mind that for a lot of athletes, there's an element of rotation that created the patient's symptoms in the first place. So we can put a little bit of rotation into our clinical tests to be a little bit more specific or sensitive. Again, just keep in mind that we're not very specific and sensitive with these tests, but we're trying to reproduce that mechanism of injury that maybe reproduce or maybe cause the injury in the first place. So what we'll do is hands on the hips, Tara, and from here, I want you to back bend just like you were doing previously. Go for it. And then from here, I want you to rotate and try to touch your opposite side heel. Yep, so now we're adding a little bit of rotation. And if there's no pain yet, is this hurting you at all? We can actually add a little bit of overpressure. Just keep in mind, this is kind of mean. Go ahead and push, very good. Does that reproduce your normal symptoms? A little bit, okay, yeah. So then you would have a positive test there. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that you can have a pars fracture on one side versus the other. So one side might feel fine. Make sure you do it on both. Next, we'll take a look at prone extension. So Tara, I'm gonna take your hands and put it underneath of your armpits. From here, leave your hips on the table and press up as high as you're able to. Now, keep in mind, if you have a patient that had a bunch of positive tests with standing extension, I wouldn't push this, okay? This can be really provocative, right? However, in standing, a lot of athletes will protect their spine and they might not be getting to the end range of extension to pick up their injury. In prone, we can have the patient fully relax their spine. So go ahead and try to relax, 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 relax and we're getting full end range of motion, and this may be provocative where some of the standing extension tests were not, okay? The next test we can try is taking your hands and putting them together, and then putting your forearms on the table like so. Very good. Let's take one hand and place it behind your back. And from here, I want you to turn and rotate up towards the ceiling as far as you're able to. And I can actually add a little bit of overpressure and rotate and extend a little bit more, and you can relax for now. And for some of those patients where they got an injury through extension and rotation, so think about you know hitting a baseball, um, these folks may be provocative in this test and they weren't in some of the other tests just because of that specific mechanism. Presence of a step-off deformity. This is for the diagnosis of spondylolisthesis. So you have your patient lie on their belly and then from here, we're gonna palpate their spinous processes. So I'm just showing you in a model. So essentially, I'm gonna palpate the spine, one spinous process to the other, I'm looking to see if there's a difference in height of one spinous process on the other. If I have a slippage of one vertebrae on the other, then we should feel a difference between the height of one spinous process to the next. If there is a step off deformity present, that would be a positive special test. And this actually has a decent specificity for ruling in spinal lotus thesis. So let's say you go through examination and you're not finding pain with extension, it hurts with flexion, it doesn't seem like a spiny injury. I think it's A-OK -okay to start treating these folks. What I will say, if they're between the ages of 12 and 18, they're adolescent, they play a sport, if they're not getting better in let's say two to four weeks, it might be beneficial to send them to a doctor just because they are at risk for having a spiny fracture. If you have a patient where you suspect any sort of spiny fracture, it's very important that you send them to the doctor for some imaging, just because if we don't pick up on these injuries and we don't treat them like a spiny fracture, they may end up with something worse over the course of time. I always keep in mind that study by McKaylee all the way back in 1995. So basically, if you have an athlete between the ages of 12 and 18, especially if they uh, are in a sport that requires a lot of extension of the spine and they have low back pain, around 50% of those athletes are going to have a spiny fracture. So if you have an athlete in that population with low back pain, you might wanna think about referring for imaging right away. Now, I know it's not great to order a lot of imaging. Uh, I think generally speaking, we probably over order imaging and we're trying to reduce the burden, I guess, on a medical economic system. However, in this case, I think it's definitely justified and I don't think you should feel bad about saying to the doctor to figure out if your patient has an, a fracture of their spine. So now you're an expert diagnosing spiny fractures, but you're still gonna need some good exercise to treat these folks. Whoa, looks like I have a video over here where I go over my favorite exercises for folks that have low back pain. So go ahead and click on that link and I'll see you on the next video.